this week's Vaticano. Pope Benedict XVI speaks of the joy of the Christmas season. At Mass for the Epiphany, he ordains two new archbishops and later names the church's newest cardinals, including two from the US. He also baptises 60 newborns and celebrates the Lord's baptism with a reminder to every Christian of his role as a child of God. Benedict XVI also hosts diplomats to the Vatican for the so-called State of the World Address. It's one of this ambassador's final appointments as he heads home to Australia after three full years of service. Also, an association committed to assisting the Pope looks to the future. All this coming up on Vatican. As the Christmas season came to a close, 7,000 people met with Pope Benedict XVI at the Paul VI Hall on January the 4th for the general audience. During his address, he spoke of the joy of Christmas. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pax Vobis. Dear brothers and sisters, in this Christmas season, the Church celebrates the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God and his revelation as the Savior of the world. From the witness of Scripture and the Church's tradition, we see that our first reaction to the birth of Jesus should be one of joy in the knowledge that God has assumed our humanity in order to make us share us in his own divine life. The contemplation of this wondrous exchange, which we experience most powerfully in the Eucharist, invites us to recognize our lofty dignity as God's adopted sons and daughters. The liturgy Jesus us said Christmas is a vest of light, for Christ, the night of the world, and the radiance of the Father's glory has brought us from darkness into his kingdom of light and called us to bring the light of the gospel to every creature. In Italian, he highlighted the meaning of the season. Christmas means pausing to contemplate the child, the mystery of God who became man in humility and poverty. Above all, it means once again making that child, who is Christ the Lord, part of ourselves, so as to live our lives from His, so as to make His feelings, His thoughts, His actions, our feelings, thoughts, and actions. To celebrate Christmas is to express the joy, novelty, and light which that birth brought into our lives, that we too may bring others joy, true novelty, and the light of God. Choirs like this one dedicated the Pope a brief song. And he extended his wishes to the faithful for 2012. Upon all of your families and works the Lord's blessings of joy, peace and prosperity for the year which has just begun. Happy New Year! Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus.
The solemnity of the Epiphany of the Lord, January the 6th, was a particularly eventful day at the Vatican. It saw the Pope celebrate Mass in St. Peter's Basilica for the Episcopal ordinations of two new Vatican diplomatic representatives called Apostolic Nuncios. Through the right, American Monsignor Charles Brown of New York became an Archbishop to soon take up his post as Apostolic Nuncio to Ireland. And Polish Archbishop Marek Solzhinsky will be representing the Pope in the nations of Georgia and Armenia. During his homily, Pope Benedict XVI compared the Magi, who are celebrated on the Epiphany, to bishops. Bishops, he said, are men of restless yet watchful heart, driven to bring themselves ever closer to God while following in the footsteps of Christ as the shepherd. The wise men followed the star. Through the language of creation, they discovered the God of history. To be sure, the language of creation alone is not enough. Only God's Word, which we encounter in sacred scripture, was able to mark out their path definitively. Creation and scripture, reason and faith, must come together so as to lead us forward to the living God. There has been much discussion over what kind of star it was that the wise men were following. Some suggest a planetary constellation, or a supernova, that is to say one of those stars that is initially quite weak, in which an inner explosion releases a brilliant light for a certain time, or a comet, or something else. This debate we may leave to the experts. The great star, the true supernova that leads us on, is Christ himself. He is, as it were, the explosion of God's love, which causes a great white light of his heart to shine upon the world. The Pope asked that God's stars, the saints, continue to shine upon the new archbishops and show them the path that they too may lead men towards the true light. With the end of Mass, the Pope hadn't yet finished his public acts for the day. From his studio window overlooking St. Peter's, he prayed the noon Angelus and made a major announcement. 22 new cardinals, including two men from the United States, will be created in a consistory at the Vatican on February the 18th. Archbishop Timothy Dolan of the Archdiocese of New York, who is also President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and Archbishop Edwin O'Brien, outgoing Archbishop of Baltimore and recently appointed Head of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre, will both be among that group. Other Cardinal-elects include a majority of Europeans who lead Archdiocese or Holy See departments, like three of these men who were at the Epiphany Mass. Among those from nations outside of Europe is Archbishop Thomas Collins of Toronto in Canada. Thus, Pope Benedict XVI set the scene for another spectacular day at the Vatican next month. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Two events marked the January 9th Feast of the Lord's Baptism at the Vatican. First was the baptism of 60 newborns, predominantly the children of Vatican employees in the unique Sistine Chapel. Officially, they are the only baptisms the Pope does during the year. Afterwards, a healthy crowd gathered here in St. Peter's Square to pray the Angelus. There, Pope Benedict XVI asked each person to renew their joy as children of God. The Holy Father has encouraged us with the confidence of our filial condition 
with God, our condition of God's children. And maybe we are all not parents, but for sure we are all children, so this is a common condition. It is true that we do not choose to be born, but it is also true that through our relationship with our parents, we mature the reality that this life is a gift from God. Also, for God, we are all children. God is at the origin of the existence of every creature, and He is Father in a singular way to every human being. He has with him or her a unique personal relationship. Every one of us is wanted, loved by God. And also in this relationship with God, we can be reborn, that is to say, become what we are. This happens through faith, through a profound and personal yes to God as the origin and foundation of our existence. With this yes, I accept life as a gift from the Father who is in heaven, a parent I do not see, but in whom I believe and feel in the depth of my heart to be my Father and that of my brothers in humanity, an immensely good and faithful Father. The Pope continues explaining that this faith is based in Jesus Christ, who has made the Father known to us, and to believe that Jesus is the Son of God requires being reborn from high, from God, who is love. So the Pope talked of the meaning of baptism, which is a new birth through the grace of the Holy Spirit in the church's womb. And ending the Christmas season, the Holy Father concluded giving thanks to God who has become man so that we become his children. And we renew our faith in the joy of being children as men and women and as Christians. And we ask the good God to help us to really live out this condition of children not only by word, but also by facts. And so the Christmas season ended on a beautiful sunny day at the Vatican. Representatives from 179 nations of the world met with Pope Benedict XVI on January the 10th for his annual State of the World Address. It was a sobering message. Truly, the world is gloomy wherever it is not brightened by God's light. Truly the world is dark wherever men and women no longer acknowledge their bond with the Creator and thereby endanger their relation to other creatures and to creation itself. The present moment is sadly marked by a profound disquiet and the various crises, economic, political and social, are a dramatic expression of this. He called for new commitments to address economic and financial crisis in the world. He lamented that in some nations, Christians are deprived of fundamental rights and sidelined from public life, while in others they endure violent attacks against their churches and their homes. But of course, there is always hope. The birth of the Prince of Peace teaches us that life does not end in a void that its destiny is not decay, but eternal life. Christ came so that we might have life and have it in abundance. Only when the future is certain as a positive reality does it become possible to live the present as well. He urged the ambassadors to promote education and the protection of creation in their countries to counter the crisis. This Australian is on his way home, giving up a post through which he has become well known in Rome. It's been uh, an uplifting, invigorating posting as an Australian ambassador to the Holy See, first Rome resident ambassador to the Holy See, but basta, enough, because I've got uh, quite a young family and because I think it should be a turnover and renewal every three, four years. It's certainly getting to meet some very wonderful and very senior people, starting with uh, the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, 
the 16th, but many beavering away behind the scenes, below the radar screen, who are the most dedicated, dynamic people. And uh, you learn a great deal from them as you move around this eternal city of Rome and uh, beyond. Uh, and so personally, that's been an absolute delight, plus the chance in winter on Saturdays to complete writing a book, Trains Unlimited, in the 21st century, because when my family's not here, it was a chance just to lock up and uh, put the research down in writing on that and a few other subjects. On the professional front, pursuing three issues, religious freedom, interfaith dialogue, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist relations and the like, uh, very important for Australia and Australia's relations with Indonesia, the largest Muslim population nation in the world, and the issue of food security and the coming world famine. Becoming a familiar face in the crowd at Vatican events, like this ordination of seminarians from the North American College to the diaconate last October, or the resurrection of this steam train last summer to raise money for Caritas. Taking part in so many events, he says, is one of the benefits of being a resident ambassador in Rome. It is uh, so much easier to do the job if you are on the ground here in Rome. The Vatican uh, is not uh, uh, an entirely closed ship, but uh, you have to know where to look, uh, which conferences to attend, which contacts to pursue. And if you're only flying in for four times a year from Dublin or from The Hague or from Geneva, uh, then that becomes uh, very difficult to do in a comprehensive professional way. It would be not wise for countries to bail out uh, at this time. Yes, the Holy See goes through cycles. And at one period of the pontificate of Pope John Paul II, there was a lot on the boil. The coming down of the Berlin Wall, the opening up of Eastern Europe, which Pope John Paul II was directly involved. Uh, the border treaty between Argentina and Chile just over 25 years ago where a border war was about to break out. Again, Pope John Paul II, the Holy See, fully involved. There's a good deal of information, although not too much should be made of that flowing through the hub of Rome, best tap by having embassies here. Yes, the number of Rome resident ambassadors will fluctuate. It probably is possible that uh, one or two may drop off during this period of great economic difficulty. But uh, I think the smarter way would be to perhaps uh, look for cost cutting whilst maintaining uh, the embassy, but perhaps reducing the size of uh, some of the larger embassies is uh, something to expect in these tough times. Uh, closure. Well, I'm not sure that that would be a very wise step, but it's for others to make that judgment. Looking back, this day in 2010 was one of the highlights of his time in Rome. It's the canonisation ceremony that included Australia's first saint, the religious sister, St Mary MacKillop. Throughout his stay, the time close to the Pope helped him to build up his own Catholic faith. It's been uplifting personally as well as professionally. Um, not so much for the grand ceremonies across the way, but because you get to experience uh, a raft of levels and a time to, to uh, attend many uh, conferences which relate to spirituality and the like, but also to go to a place called Caravita Church, which happens to be where Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart once played in Rome, next to St Ignacio. Uh, there's a mass on English on uh, Sundays at 11 a.m. and a very um, interesting group of four priests leading that and uh, giving sermons which are way above the average country sermon in a country parish in Australia, for which I'll probably now get belted up when I go back to Australia for saying that. But these are people at the peak of their university lecturing careers at the Gregorian University and elsewhere. These are people who are professional in every way, but wonderful priests leading a small community at Caravita. And that's certainly helped my faith. So that's it. It's back down under to the farm and writing. In Buco El Lupo, Aravadechi. Good luck, goodbye.
welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. There's a little-known entity within the Vatican walls with a lot of history. Laymen who carry on a centuries-old service to the Pope. This man has been associated with them since just after World War II, back when they were known as the Palatine Guard. The ex-Palatine Guard was a voluntary military service, but by military we're talking about the most peaceful army in the world, because it was for the Pope, the King of Peace. So not the King of a territory that needs military men. Our function was a decorative and routine one, routine for the service of the pilgrims and the faithful. Our point of service was being close to the Holy See, to the Pope, and serving this institution that for a Catholic is the maximum possible. So the experience was extremely positive. Certainly there was displeasure when on September the 15th, 1970, the Palatine Guard was dissolved, but we did understand the reasons for which it was done. It was after the Second Vatican Council, things had changed. So this armed guard with the church was no longer, I won't say necessary, because perhaps it wasn't necessary before either, but it was from a different time. In fact, in the Vatican today, only the Swiss Guard and the Gendarmerie remain. But the Palatine Guard and the Noble Guard, that were voluntary services, only decorative and parade guards, were disbanded, and it was a real trauma for us. But we realized that it was necessary for the Holy See to get rid of these units. But we didn't actually leave the Vatican at all, because our faith and our faithfulness were unchanged. Thus was instituted the Association of Saints Peter and Paul, which Pope Paul VI himself, when he decreed the dissolution, said could proceed and work to carry on the good that the Palatine Guard had done for so many years by establishing an association to meet the needs of charitable and spiritual nature. These three gentlemen represent the present and future of the Association of St. Peter's and Paul. The association works in the fields of liturgy, culture and charity. Perhaps the element it has always had in common with the foundation of the Guard in 1850 is its charitable role. Its goal is to continue to offer assistance to people's needs, but most of all, to attend to the reception of pilgrims who visit Rome. Pilgrims who arrive tired, or find an unwelcoming environment. People who bring this spirit to the seat of the Pope, these are the people we have tried to reach with our testimony, first as Palatine Guards, and now as an association. Today, association members offer directions, information and advice to pilgrims and visiting priests during liturgical celebrations in St. Peter's, especially on feast days. The future of the group will one day be in the hands of young men like this one. He and others will be formed with a sort of renaissance education through studies in spirituality, culture, charity, music and sport. They hope to become stronger men of faith. I've been able to truly rediscover the importance of friendship, true friendship. I've been able to do this also through the Liturgy of the Hours been able to develop a love for Christ. The student group forms us to confront what will be in our future, what will be of each of us young people. Besides studies, there must be an essential logic, and this group gives us that. We have, as service to the Holy See teaches us, a Christian principle to preserve also outside the Vatican walls. We must transmit also among us young people the beauty of Christian friendship in the light of the faith. As Christians, we all have to know our faith, but we also have to live it. And what we try to do is to show them that uh, religion isn't an area of life that you reserve to one particular sector. It's one of these, it, it's, it's supposed to have an effect in, in one's life as a whole. And so, for that reason, uh, all the other areas uh, are interconnected with the religious. And in an effort to try and bring that across to them that everything is united, where once a month we take all the people involved in formation and all the students on a hike somewhere outside Rome, which, which uh, will always involve a religious element, a cultural, uh, a recreational element, mountain climbing and you know quite a lot of other things as well. So in that they get to see that, every, that um, all the areas of formation form part of an integral whole. All this is essential for the association as it moves past its 40th year. 
We have existed for 150 years as the Palatine Guard and 40 years as the Association. We are not extinct, and we continue on because of the young people who come in with that spirit that we Romans have always had, that of being faithful to the Apostolic See. And this faithfulness attested to by Romans is found in every generation.